morning to uh, our speaker, Gil Anijar. Uh, first, uh, just a series of uh, preliminaries. Uh, this is the uh, uh, fifth seminar in our series, which we somewhat pretentiously call uh, Global Conversations. Uh, but it is actually beyond Kampala, and that makes it global for us. Uh, just a couple of requests. Uh, one is that uh, when you're not speaking, uh, please turn off your video. Uh, that will just make for a better reception for everybody else. Uh, you can turn it on when you're speaking. Uh, I have unmuted everybody. So when you're speaking, I've muted everybody. So when you're speaking, please unmute yourself. Um, A number of people uh, have asked uh, how they can register for this entire series. And if you look at the invitation, which we sent out on the uh, sort of lower right-hand corner of the invitation, it says that to register, uh, you email uh, communication at miser. Miser is M-I-S-R. Communication at miser at gmail.com. So if you email that and just say you would like to be put on the list so you receive every invitation for um, every seminar in, in, in this calendar year, uh, you, will, you will get that. Um, we will be having uh, uh, two discussions after the main speaker. And if you have a question to ask, uh, I suggest you use the chat function and simply give your name and uh, identify your institution. And then if you want the question to be read out, you put the question there. If not, I'll just call on you and you give the question as you would in a, in a live event. Uh, next week, uh, we will be having uh, Professor Talal Asad next Wednesday, same time. Uh, he will be talking about uh, thinking about religion through Wittgenstein. Uh, and again, to register, uh, communication at miser at gmail.com. Now, my great pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker for today, uh, which is Professor Gil Anijar. Uh, the head of the Department of Religion at uh, Columbia University in New York City, the author of uh, Blood, a Critique of Christianity. Uh, his topic for today is the religion of translation, reading Derrida. Uh, you should all have received the Derrida text on this, and I hope you've had a chance to read it. Um, we will be having two discussions following uh, Professor Anishar's really lecture. Uh, the first discussant uh, is uh, Yosef uh, Sintayehu, uh, a year four doctoral student at Miser, who's just beginning his field work. And the second discussant will be Lisa Damon. Uh, a year six doctoral student at Miser who is just finishing writing her thesis. So to begin with, Professor Gilanijar, The Religion of Translation, reading Derrida. Gil, enormously pleased to welcome you on this. Um, thank you. Um, but, uh, I realized that the last time I was at Miser was actually in 2014, which by now feels like uh, you know, COVID-19 included feels like um, literally centuries ago. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to, uh, to, to be back. Uh, uh, there's no telling how, um, how long we will have to travel by Zoom uh, as opposed to actually travel if, um, if ever. So, um, so thank you for including me in this amazing lineup that you've had for, uh, for those conversations. Um, I um, I took my task. Uh, I mean, I gave you a title, Mahmoud, uh, um, but I took my task to um, to be um, somehow. Um, 
I can only hope, pedagogical in the sense that I recognize that not everybody is uh, familiar with Derrida. Uh, I did think that the text on translation, uh, which is Derrida's first um, kind of thematic engagement with the question of translation was a good uh, introduction. Um, and I did that as well because I have been uh, working on the text, which uh, the title of which is The Religion of Translation, where uh, one of my concerns was that we, we have, after, uh, after Talal Assad, who is here uh, joining us, uh, we have been thinking about the translation of religion, uh, religion as a category translated across languages. Um, but, um, but I believe that Walter Benjamin, who is uh, extensively quoted and discussed by Derrida in this piece, uh, raises a, a question that is uh, somehow not quite symmetric, um, but related uh, as if chiasm, chiasmically, by right, the figure of a chiasm is kind of an X that has a, a longer leg, um, chiasmically related to the, uh, the religion of translation. In other words, Benjamin and Derrida in this text, as you uh, will have seen, um, relates the question of religion to the question of translation and the question of translation to the question of religion. The figure of the sacred is one of the uh, central ways in which this is done. But, um, but part of the uh, argument is that our conception of translation, however multifarious, uh, is not independent from our um, understanding of religion and from uh, the religion that um, that we, as it were, belong to. Um, so that's just the general frame for why I gave that particular title and why I may or may not entirely keep to the promise that this title may or may not constitute. But, uh, but obviously, in the questions, uh, in the conversation that will follow, I, uh, I expect and I hope that you will ask me uh, to say more about this. Um, I should also say that obviously, uh, as I've already mentioned, we are, um, we are in a time, uh, um, the time of the virus, Derrida might, uh, might have said. Um, and, and there's something quite appropriate about speaking about Derrida in a time of uh, virus. Um, one, because we are uh, displaced both temporarily and spatially. Uh, Obviously, the, the, the virtual experience uh, uh, has much to do with, uh, with that displacement. It didn't start with the virus, although, of course, we have been around viruses for a long time, and viruses have become uh, a, a kind of digital feature, uh, uh, an obvious feature of what it means to reside uh, on, on the internet. Uh, Derrida was uh, very interested in, uh, in viruses. He uh, used, in fact, um, from very early on in his uh, writing, the notion of contamination um, in order to describe what it is that he, in fact, is interested in. Um, contamination, contagion, the possibilities of remaining uh, immune, protected, um, enclosed, um, closed upon oneself and in fact uh, uh, assured, uh, as it were, confident of one's um, oneness, right? This is me, this is my body. Um, I'm already quoting as you can uh, hear, right? Here is my body. Um, but here is my body and my body can, should, should not be um, invaded. I can protect myself. Um, uh, in order to be what I am, I, uh, I am not that which may or may not contaminate me. And contamination, of course, is exactly what happens when I am no longer myself. And protection in this context is something that uh, went on to occupy Derrida um, uh, more and more toward the end of um, toward the end of his uh, career, uh, where he got very interested in the notion of autoimmunity. Now, this is obviously related to the AIDS crisis, uh, but autoimmunity and autoimmune um, uh, systems um, and failures were uh, very much part of, um, of medical research and um, the, the um, 
possibility of understanding what in fact the autoimmune is, what, what immunity means, um, was uh, very important to, uh, to Derrida. Uh, and particularly because in a typically Derridian fashion, what he was uh, fascinated by was the idea of a protection that might end up harming the self. Now, we are at a moment when in order to protect ourselves, we must close ourselves off within our houses. But surely, were we to do this in an absolute manner, we would end up, of course, depleting ourselves, right? Food must still come in. Air must still come in. Um, and with air and with food, um, all kinds of things can come in, right? So we can take precautions, but the idea that we could be fully protected is predicated on a fantasy because we are, as it were, open beings, right? Our body is in fact open. Circulation, not only within the body, but also from without, must be part of, um, uh, is part of us. We cannot protect ourselves from air, right? Although if the air is carrying viruses, we might want to. Yes, by wearing a mask, but we cannot interrupt the flow of air. And with the flow of air, the flow of viruses. So the question of protecting ourselves, should it be achieved, should we be able to protect ourselves entirely, um, would, uh, would lead in fact to our destruction. Um, and this is, you could call it a paradox, uh, you could call it a contradiction, but uh, you will, uh, having read even if only one text by Derrida, you will have recognized that the, the, the binary opposition, say, between inside and outside, is something that protection must both preserve and interrupt. Right? Um, in other words, in order to be protected, I must still breathe. I cannot protect myself from air. Um, and yet, in order to be protected, I should be, should be protected from air, yes? Um, and by air, of course, I mean everything that comes with it. So that um, aporia, as it were, right? I must be protected, but I cannot protect myself, right? Each one being a kind of absolute imperative is something that uh, Derrida was uh, very concerned with. Now, having said that, in order to put ourselves in the place where we are, right? And even though we are not in the same place, we are not in the same time, uh, we are in fact displaced and constantly displaced. This didn't start again with the virus, but I thought that it might be a way to mark both the place and time, the non-place and non-time, the non not shared place and not shared time that we are nonetheless in. Um, Maybe to bring it um, down to translation. Mahmoud was telling me that translation uh, has become a difficult thing. Just like protection uh, in what I just said should become a difficult thing, right? Now, Derrida does not make protection a difficult thing. Protection is a difficult thing, right? A contradictory thing, an aporetic thing. Um, translation is an aporetic thing. And I wanted to show you this um, uh, uh, first um, because one could almost say that God invented deconstruction. Um, we'll see about this, but I wanted to show you um, a text that you probably, since we're gonna be talking about the Bible, obviously, I wanted to show you the very beginning, uh, almost the very beginning. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and um, so um, I'm going to skip over the very beginning, uh, and I'm only going to focus on the phrase, uh, on the verse, verse three that I've underlined. One of the uh, important distinctions that Derrida wrote about and that he mentions in the Tour de Babel, in the text that I've sent you to uh, read, um, which will already introduce us to the question of translation, um, uh, can be uh, seen right here in this particular uh, um, verse. First of all, um, we have an author, right? 
we have an author, although it's a peculiar author, the voice of God, God said, although that author, as you will have noticed, speaks um, in the third person. In other words, God doesn't say I, right? But rather there is reported speech, but it is the reported speech of God. And then we have a direct quotation, right? Let there be light. And then period. And then the word of God, right? We are reading the Bible. The word of God adds a description. And there was light. So the first thing to notice is, of course, the distinction between that which is quoted and that which is not quoted. Right? Although technically, everything we're reading is, we might already say, a translation, but certainly reported speech. Right? It is the voice of God that speaks about the the voice of God. The word of God quotes God and, um, and reports that God spoke. Yes? Um, and then we have the actual speech, let there be light. The quotation marks are, as it happens, a translation. The original Hebrew text does not use quotation marks. It's a typographic convention. Um, so the translation is visible at that very level, at the level of the quotation marks. But there is no question that the speech uh, that we are reading, hearing, is the voice of God. And were we to make uh, a distinction between the quoted speech and the non-quoted speech, we would have to recognize that there are basically at least two kinds. One that describes God said, and one that says that, um, in fact, issues a kind of command, let there be light, All right? That distinction between a description, God said, or afterwards, and there was light, that, dis that dis distinction between a speech that is describing and a speech that is asserting, commanding, um, is a, 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 a distinction that has been described by a, a philosopher that was an inspiration to Derrida, among many others, uh, whose name is J.L. Austin, John Austin, uh, who wrote a book that if you haven't read, I highly recommend, called How to Do Things with Words. How to Do Things with Words. And you can see here that we are given, as it were, the original example of what Austin calls a performative, right? Uh, Judith Butler may have told you something about this last week. Um, a performative assertion is something that does not describe, right? At the time God says, let there be light, there is no light yet, right? God, by saying, let there be light, brings about the light. He creates light. Um, in other words, he performs, right? He performs, he brings about that which he says. Another very common example, uh, which will remind you of how important performatives are when it comes to sexual difference, is it's a boy, right? The moment when a baby is named boy or girl. And another example um, is I declare you husband and wife, right? Um, uh, that moment is not a description. Before that moment, the couple was not a couple. The man was not a husband, the woman was not a wife. Um, by saying, I declare you, and having the authority to make that declaration, one performs the transformation, and from that moment on, the addressees are literally transformed. I was not a husband, I am now a husband. This is something that I became, right? Let there be light is the original example. God brings about light, which then raises a question, because as Austin explains, in order for the performative to function, the person saying it cannot just be anyone, right? So you are all here in front of me on Zoom. If I were to say to all of you, I declare you now husbands and wives, nothing would have happened, except perhaps that I would have made a fool of myself. But my authority, whatever authority I am granted as a scholar speaking to you now, 
a translator, as it were, of Derrida. Um, I do not have the authority to declare you husbands and wives. Um, so presumably, and this is an issue of some contention, presumably the person uttering the performative must in fact have the authority to do so. It gets complicated because of course with marriage, as you well know, there are some marriages that have been performed that have not been authorized, not by the church and not by society sometimes, that were nonetheless performed as an act of rebellion. And the marriage that was there performed was recognized at least by the people present, the people assenting to the marriage. So there, it is conceivable to have a situation where even though I do not have the authority to say, I declare you husband and wife or husband and husband, right? Or wife and wife on, on the non-heteronormative model of marriage. Um, and though I do not have the authority, your assent and the assent of the community here gathered may actually grant me as it were retrospectively the authority to have said what I said and therefore to have bring, brought, bring, to have brought about the transformation, the performative transformation that the statement um, constitutes. So, but in the case of God, the question should be moot. Who will say God doesn't have the authority to say let there be light? Not only that, who will say that God does not have the power to bring light about? God is the creator. And as creator, he creates. And so when he says, let there be light, there is no question of the performative being felicitous. Felicitous is the term that Austin uses in order to describe a successful performative, right? And the nature of the performative is that no one needs to say, okay, right? I declare you husband and wife, and then I can go on and say, um, uh, you may kiss the bride, right? But um, there is, of course, that other moment when I ask, right? I, the, the, the officiant, ask, do you agree? And by saying, I do, you are also performing a, a performative, right? You are also performing. By saying, I do, you are entering into the agreement, just like if you were signing a contract. And as you will have seen in Detour de Bavel in the text uh, uh, that Derrida wrote on translation, the issue of contract is very important. So by saying I do, you are signing the contract. And yet my saying, I declare you now husband and wife is as it were independent of whatever you have agreed to. It is a performative in itself. Again, we can talk about the conditions of felicitous performative, but uh, the point though is that as a performative, it works without anyone having to do anything else, right? Let there be light is the example, right? The, the paradigmatic example of a successful performative. Except that the power of the phrase, the power of the phrase should be performative at two levels. One, light should come about, right? That is the success of let there be light. But it should also be so successful as to reiterate, as it were, the creative power of God. So when God said, let there be light, he signifies his power to create at the same time as he creates. And the power of divine speech should be so that its performative power its ability to do what it says should be absolute, as absolute as God's power. So imagine the strangeness and what I'm trying to do now by reading um, with you and by looking at this verse, what you should be able to see is the absolute scandal that follows this paradigmatic example of a performative divine speech. Let there be light, punct, right, period. It's enough. 
What else do we need to know? This is God speaking. We know. He said, let there be light. So, of course, we know what happened afterwards. So, why would it be necessary to supplement, and the word supplement is a major Derridian term, yes, to supplement the absolute power of the divine performative with something that is derivative, secondary, and frankly, unimportant. A descriptive speech, right? Something the power of which is absolutely incomparable, incommensurable, untranslatable in relation to the divine performative. The divine performative is all powerful. What could descriptive speech add? Austin calls descriptive speech const constative. A constat in French is a description. This is the way things are. I'm just saying the way things are. Yes? And there was light is, a, as it were, paradigmatic constative. It's just a descriptive. Why was it needed? How could it have been needed? Well, one answer is that even the most powerfully performative speech still needs another, still needs a witness, still needs a response. And even if that's re that response, if you, if you wish you could evoke in your minds the image of the master and the slave, even the most powerless witness, a mere descriptive must be there in order for the absolute powerful, God himself, to be what they are. A performative without a constative might as well not have happened. Now it is a, a very, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen uh, now uh, just because um, I don't think it's uh, needed, uh, although I need to figure out how to do that now. Um, oh, stop share. Um, so even the most powerful performative is still, as it were, reaching out toward that which is not what it is, a mere descriptive. Now, if we were to get into this whole performative constative thing, we would have to ask actually, but doesn't the descriptive have performative power? Which is where Austin actually tripped over himself. But we don't need to get into that. The only thing that I wanna say at this point is that what you will have noticed is that the performative must be translated into the constative. Because anyone might otherwise have said, and in fact, the rabbis, the Jewish interpreters of the Bible, asked the question and said, well, um, God said, let there be light. If you had stopped there, wouldn't you have been noticing, after all, you're reading on your book and you're aware of the fact that there is light. You know that the light came about. And one of the amazing things, of course, is that the rabbis say the light that was created then has nothing to do with the light that you know. In other words, it is not empirically verifiable. Saying so, the rabbis basically acknowledge that there was a good reason why we needed to be told and there was light. But that doesn't diminish the tension, the translation from performative to constative. Now remember, the performative is on principle at least a fundamentally different kind of speech, as it were a different language than the constative. So the translation from one to the other is strictly speaking, impossible, right? There is no way that by saying, and there was light, I am in any way reproducing, translating the power of divine speech, none whatsoever. So it's a, if, even if I say it's a translation, I have to admit it's a failed translation.
And yet it's also a necessary translation. Let's say it's a necessary translation because the light that was created um, is not verifiable, if only for that reason. But it's also the case that someone could have asked at any moment, was there light? Right? On principle, even if one is reading with the light of the sun, which by the way has not been created yet in the story of creation, even uh, um, if one is reading by the light of the sun, one can still ask, wait, did it work? And even the all powerful divine speech cannot avoid that. Which raises the question more generally as to what the relation is between the word of God and God. What is the relation between the author, the most powerful authors of all time, and his word? Now, some might say, well, it's the word of God and we must treat it as such and we must understand that it is what it is because it is the word of God. In other words, it is tied to the power of God and therefore there is no asking, did it work? This is simply a question that should not be asked, which is fine. But someone had to ask in order for the Bible to say, and there was light. It's as if the question was silently asked and the Bible wanted to preempt that question by answering it. If it had not done so, we might have said, well, of course there was light. And not known, by the way, about the light that was not available for empirical verification. That the divine light is not just the light that we see every day. So by giving us the let there be light, the Bible is enabling us to ask about the empirical dimension of the divine creation. Is this something that is verifiable? Or is this something that in order to be verified must actually be testified to? And the relation between God's speech or God and the Bible, God and his word, between the performative and the constative, between the original and the translation, between the act and its witnessing is in fact the same. It is impossible and necessary. That in a nutshell is what Derrida has to say and something that he will say and repeat throughout his career. And it, in your reading of the text, I assume you have seen that Derrida a number of times says, translation is impossible and necessary. And we must confront that aporia, right? We can ignore it. We cannot think about it, but we will be confronted with it. At a prosaic level, every time we say something and it is misunderstood. Every time we say something by communicating our authority and our authority fails. One of my favorite examples is given by another French philosopher named Jean-François Lyotard, who gives the example of that rupture that is between the performative and the constative, that is open by any performative, the possibility of its failure must be there, otherwise, otherwise its success uh, um, has no point, right? If there was no gap between the success of the performative, between the performative and its success, then, um, then it wouldn't be a performative. It would just be an event, right? One moment you look, it's darkness, and the next moment you look, and it's light. Nothing has been said, yes? But if something is said, then the problem of reception, the problem of translation, the problem of response, the problem of testimony is there. Ultimately, this is not just a linguistic issue, but we can stay with the linguistic because it is, it is our topic for the day, translation. Um, otherwise, you remember, translation is, of course, also non-linguistic, yes. Uh, um, Jacobson, the Derrida quotes, has three models of translation, <laughs> interlinguistic, intralinguistic, and intersemiotic. Uh, and those three kinds of translations, the, th the last one is actually across meaning systems and in fact uh, um, 
extraneous, as it were, to language. So uh, translation can also be outside of language. And so everything that I'm saying could still be reported. And obviously, by speaking about event and testimony, I'm already signifying that, um, that problem. And so the question of what happens when, um, when I speak a performative or a constative, what happens to the reception is, um, um, as it were, internal to the performative and to the constative. It's not just what happens afterwards, is that the very notion of a performative is predicated on it being successful or possibly a failure. It has to be possible, otherwise the performative is not what it is, right? A performative that would always be successful would just be what happens. So when Derrida says um, that the translation of the performative to the constative undoes the distinction between the performative and the constative because one is in need of the other, what he does is to show contamination, meaning that one was never what it was without the other. There is no moment where the performative is a pure performative because it is always traversed, as it were, affected by the constitutive and vice versa. So the example I wanted to give you because, uh, uh, because um, uh, it, it's funny and one should remember that Derrida is also a very funny writer and I hope that there were occasions when you laughed a little when you were reading. Um, the, uh, um, uh, the example though comes from Lyotard and it is um, imagine in a, in a war uh, the officer uh, jumps ahead, comes out of the trench, and says, avanti, right? Uh, uh, forward. And the soldiers, instead of treating this as an order, a performative, if there was one, treat it as a different kind of performative, a performance, as it were. And they say, bravo, right? The officer jumps. And the soldiers said, bravo, very impressive. Um, now, it is a proper response, right? Because it is impressive in a time of war to jump out of the trenches by saying avanti. Um, but obviously, this is not what the performance calls for. And yet, how could the officer prevent the reception of his authoritative speech? Nothing can prevent it. And the response will, in fact, determine what the speech was. Another way of saying this, and I, uh, I can see that just by explaining this to you, I've uh, almost run out of time, which is probably a good thing. Uh, 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 one of the things I wanted to tell you is that, first of all, Derrida is a reader, right? But a reader is someone who reads everything. And yes, Derrida reads text. But Derrida is also, and this is one of the most famous misquotations of Derrida, of course, is that there is nothing outside the text, which in fact is not what the sentence says. What it means though, in any case, is that everything is a text, which means everything must be read. And whatever we look at, whatever we engage in, whatever we perform, we are in media res. We are in the middle of a network of a system of meaning, of habituations, of gestures and affect and institutions and all kinds of things that are there in the middle. Yes, pre-understanding, um, habits of understanding, habits of being, forms of life, as Talal Assad will talk to us about next week, uh, forms of life that are already there, right? Some of them are also being created as we speak, right? Some of them come about. This is the force of the performative. But in order to come about, they must still rely in one way or another on, a, uh, on conditions that are not simply external to what they are and what they become, right? No revolution is ex nihilo. No absolute performative, however powerful it is, is an absolute beginning not even God's absolute beginning, can manage to just begin without rely on what it begins, right? Without relying on a constative, 
on a witness, on its creation. And again, between God and his word, between God and his creation, the relation which might seem derivative, just like the translation might seem derivative and secondary to the original, it may turn out that it is the second, that which comes later or appears to come later, that defines the one. Now we already knew that. No person is a parent without having a child. So what's a parent? I'm not a parent if I haven't had a, ch a child. Once I have a child, the child makes me a parent. The child is a performative. And I, rather than the maker of the child, rather than the parent of the child, I am its effect. In other words, my existence as what I am is dependent on that which presumably comes after me. And no matter what you try, you will see that that is inescapable. It makes it impossible to be what one is. It makes it impossible for anything to be what it is. Which is why when Derrida was asked, and I'll conclude with that, when he was asked to summarize what deconstruction is, to give a definition as it were, he was very reluctant, you can imagine why, right? Because the proliferation that he's engaged in and that he attends to is of course um, irreducible. But he was understanding of pedagogical necessities and so he provided a definition. And that definition in French, untranslatable of course, is plus d'un, which literally means more than one, but it also means no less literally, no more one. One, no more. Always more than one. And you just saw that God, the most potent and powerful one, ends up being dependent on the second, that which follows. But that which follows ends up being the very condition of the one being the one. So that the one was never one before. Now, there's a theological understanding of that, which Islam asserts on a daily basis. La ilaha illallah. The number one is not a number in this case. One is out of the equation. The Greeks knew that, by the way. We knew that one is not a number. Numbers start with two. The point being that one must either be extracted from the notion of counting, which makes it an impossibility, right? Technically, strictly. At the same time, whatever it is cannot be without a witness. Cannot be what it is, cannot be recognized as what it is. In other words, makes it dependent, contingent on that which follows. Plus d'un, plus d'une langue. Never, ever more one language. And you have seen in the text that Derrida says, what happens to translation when it must translate a text in more than one language? And Derrida will of course say, there was never any such thing as a text in one language. Never. There was never such a thing as a text that is one, which is why the boundaries of the text are not granted, which is why the oneness of the text is not granted, which is why there is nothing outside the text, because the boundaries cannot be um, uh, defined, because the one is traversed, contaminated, as it were, infected by the virus, that little thing that is, you know, contingent, that is not even living, and yet transforms all of life, all of our lives, certainly. And that thing ends up defining us. I'll conclude by just saying that we have all become dangerous, dangerous to ourselves. Unwittingly, we cannot presume that we are not dangerous. Talk about autoimmunity. We can no longer presume that we are not dangerous individuals. And I invite you to read Foucault on the dangerous individual because what we are witnessing is a moment where all of us are becoming that. Talk about an infection. Whether or not we have the virus, 
whether or not we have been tested, we must relate to ourselves, to our own hands on our faces as a danger. My hand is a danger to me. I am a danger to myself. I am a danger to you at any moment. This universalization of danger is if you want the universalization of deconstruction in the sense that none of us are what we are anymore. And the way I would simply add, never were we that, ever. Thank you, I hope it made some sense. Thank you very much, Gil. Very thought provoking, very provocative, very impressive, very compelling, and very seductive. I will uh, let the discussants have the first uh, chance to, to, to respond to you. Uh, the first discussant is uh, Yosef. Yosef? Yeah. So, uh, since we all read the text and uh, listened to Professor Anijar's impressive lecture, uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, uh, I am going to raise some questions for the purpose of uh, further discussion and engagement with the text. So I, I know I, I have only 10 minutes, so I will, I will try to manage those 10 minutes. So let me start uh, from a general and consciously naive question. Uh, what Derrida describes in this, in this text, uh, De To de Babel, what he describes as translation, that is translation as a task of non-meaning, non-intentionality, non-communication, translation as a promise of pure language, a transcendental contract and depth, as well as translation as internal translations. All these notions are very different from what is understood by translation in the ordinary usage. So instead of giving it a different name, why does Derrida insist on calling it translation? Here, both translation in the ordinary sense and its transcendental condition of possibility are called translation. He refers to both the condition of possibility of translation and the usual practice of translation as translation. So this seems to, to, to be an unnecessary equivocation. Um, why is Derrida deliberately working with this equivocation? So this is my first question for our discussion. Uh, the second question is to the extent that for Derrida, and as you uh, nicely put it, there is nothing outside of the text so, which also in a way means there is nothing outside of translation, which also means in a way, there is nothing outside of confusion. <laughs> so what does Derrida's text have to tell us about translation as a mode of thought? Uh, more specifically, what's the value of confusion as a mode of thought? I mean, confusion, of course, is different different from obscurantism. So I, I'm, I'm clear about that di difference. So what's the value of confusion as a mode of thought? Um, the third question I would like to ask uh, is, so Derrida tells us that the origin, uh, uh, the originary multiplicity of language is a punishment in a way in the, in the, in the, the two, the Babel. But it's also a gift, gift. Uh, uh, he says that on page 105. It's a gift, gift, despite it is a poisoned one. So it's a gift. So the question is, what kind of gift is this gift? Um, is it what Derrida calls pure or unconditional gift? Or a gift that is beyond gift giving? 
uh, a gift beyond what uh, Marcel Mauss sees as a cycle of reciprocity between the giver and receiver. So the question is, what kind of gift uh, is Derrida talking about here? Fourth question, which uh, this is, I think, the, the question I really wanted to, to emphasize. And uh, it seems to me that the question of power uh, seems to be overlooked in this text. So uh, what do I mean by that? Um, I asked myself, what is the political lesson of the Tower of Babel? Uh, allow me to quote Derrida here on page 111. So I quote, he says, uh, in seeking to make a name for themselves, to found at the same time a universal tank and a universal genealogy, the Samites want to bring the world to reason. And this reason can signify simultaneously a colonial violence, since they would thus universalize their idiom, and a peaceful transparency of the common, sorry, of the human community. Inversely, when God imposes and opposes his name, he ruptures the rational transparency, but interrupts also the colonial violence or the linguistic imperialism. Uh, I was very much interested in this, in this uh, paragraph or in this piece. So I am tempted to say here, and allow me uh, to say this, Historically speaking, this is, I think that this is a problematic interpretation. History tells us something different. Historically speaking, both the Semites attempt to universalize one language and God's imposition of the multiplicity of language can be read as nothing but two modes of colonial violence. The colonial project of Semites signifies direct rule in a way. <laughs> and the colonial project of God is indirect rule. Like it is divide and rule in a way. So Professor Anjibar nicely put it uh, uh, at the beginning of his uh, lecture. He said, God invented translation. Absolutely, yes. But maybe with this, God invented indirect rule too. <laughs> Uh, so, the imposition or recognition of the, the multiplicity of languages or idioms may not, may not necessarily be less colonialist and less imperialist than the imposition of a universal language or universal idiom. Both can be instrumentalized by colonial power. Uh, in fact, if we look at the history of colonialism, the former turned out to be more insidious and effective form of colonial rule, indirect rule. Um, so I am also risk, risking here to say that it's true for, the same is true for translation. Um, if I'm not wrong, it seems to me that Derrida is arguing that since the impossible possibility of translation became necessary with the recognition of the multiplicity of languages. Translation has emancipatory potential. Uh, but the history of colonialism shows that translation, which emerges from the recognition of linguistic diversity, was, an was a critical and important instrument of colonial violence and linguistic and conceptual imperialism. I mean, uh, Dr. Mangareza, a postdoc fellow here at Miser, wrote her thesis where she talks about indirect writing, uh, indirect rule in writing, which is basically a kind of translation uh, that indirect writing or, in, uh, or translation is an important intellectual tool of indirect rule in Burundi. That's her, uh, one of her points in, in this thesis. 
So I, I guess the question I want to ask is, translation is a task and a demand of pure language. That's what the radar tells us. But what the radar does not explain here is that uh, what happens when it is a political and ideological task or project? What happens when it, is, when, when it becomes a political demand? Uh, not, not only just a demand of your language. Uh, what we do not learn, uh, and I, I think you, you will help us understand this, what we do not learn very much in this text of the two de Babel is the role of power relations in translation. Uh, the final question I would like to ask um, is, uh, uh, on page 139, uh, uh, Rida writes, in the hope for pure language, the task of the translator excludes the intended or leaves it between brackets and focuses on the mode of intention. So in short, intention is as less important as meaning. Uh, the mode of intentionality is what matters more. more. So the question I want to ask is, uh, what about intentionality in, the, in, the, in, in Quinton Skinner's sense of translating the intention of a text as a speech act within the broader intertextual context? Uh, if meaning cannot be translated or communicated, what about actions? like text as, as, as actions. Uh, what the author me means by saying uh, what he's saying or what he's writing. So intention as the action of the author. Can that be translated? Is there a room for that kind of translation in the reader's text? Thank you for, very much, Professor Anijar. I'm honored. And thank you, Chair. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, Yusuf. Uh, Gil, normally what we do is we have the second discussant and then you come back, uh, you, not come back, but you, 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 you then have a chance to respond to both. Uh, if Sounds that's good. okay by you, we'll, we'll move on to Lisa now. Lisa? Yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. So mine is less questions and more questions through a kind of performance with the text. <laughs> and I found a title for the performance in the text and it's a marriage contract in the form of a seminar, which he writes on page 123, <laughs> right? So here we are in this marriage of 50 something people. Um, Thank you, Professor Ani Jaif, for making us zoom in and think about the predicament of translation with you. But as we've seen, not only with you, with Joseph Graham's translation into English of Derrida's translation into French, of Walter Benjamin's task of the translator, itself a translation into French from the German by Maurice Gandillac, itself the preface to a German translation from the French of Baudelaire's Tableau Parisien that Walter Benjamin produced. So the room or the Zoom and this text are already full of translators and translations engaged as Benjamin would have it in the sacred act of growing languages. No doubt both Derrida and Benjamin would be quite pleased with this cacophony of words and speakers actively engaged in the process of rebuilding the Tower of Babel. But this time, from a multitude of confused human perspectives, rather than attempting to supplant the universality that can only be a property of the divine. This time, an oblong, sideways growing asterisk of flattened towers, I'll suggest in this reading. As I was reading Les Tours de Babel, I resisted the temptation to bring even more voices in here. I could have retrieving, for example, Derrida's original text in French, or the translation of Walter Benjamin's The Task of 
the translator that I am familiar with by Harry Zahn, one different from Joseph Graham's translation into English of Maurice de Gondillac's translation into French from the original German. But I think if I had tried to do that, I'd be missing one of the points Derrida is making, perhaps on the periphery of what Benjamin is saying, or maybe as a resistant remainder of his reading. If I did that, I would then be engaged in the heretic act of trying to disclose the original for the original that it is, and condemn the translations as pale, mistaken copies of something purer. Whereas every time Derrida gleefully mentions that he himself is writing from a translation of Benjamin rather than the original, Derrida probes us to wonder if any text, other than perhaps the sacred ones, can really maintain the status of original aren't what we think of as originals also already translations? And can't translations then become originals from which to further translate, as Derrida himself is doing here? If, with Benjamin, originals call forth their translators and beg to survive through translation, don't translations do the same? Don't they periodically beg to be retranslated as time passes and languages grow? Isn't every rereading of a familiar text always a new translation when we think, again with Benjamin, of translation as the most profound act of interpretation that builds relations between languages rather than merely copying words or rendering meanings? For a minute, Derrida departs from Benjamin and the Old Testament to think the other side of this question, something presumably he can't quite do without pulling in yet another writer translator in the person of James Joyce and in the text of Finnegan's Wake. Here he asks, how is the effect of plurality to be rendered? And what of translating with several languages at a time? Will that be called translating? Linking these two questions of the interchangeability of original and translation and the rendering of plurality in the orbit of Benjamin's thinking about translation as kinship or friendship and continuity, rather than reproduction or similitude, it works quite nicely. We're thinking horizontally about translation as relation, thinking out and wide rather than up and long. But Derrida seems to lose these sideways growing questions, these remainders, when he admittedly strays from Benjamin into a reading of the core of language as the phallus of a naked king. He writes, Benjamin, we know, does not push matters in the direction that I give to my translation. More or less faithfully, I have taken some liberty with the tenor of the original, as much as with its tongue, and again, with the original that is also for me now, the translation by Maurice de Gondillac. So my question is, why does it, admitting to the slipperiness of originality as status lead Derrida into a phallocentric reading of Benjamin's ripe fruit? Is there something he's trying to salvage as stable from this sprawling field of endlessly growing languages? Is this something patriarchy? The hymen as symbol of the sanctity of the family, the promise of translation, a marriage contract, the child is born of, but not a clone of its parents. What happens to Derrida's reading if we just take away the damn phallus? This is surely not the only way of thinking translation and the sacred together, or is it? Perhaps it is the only way of thinking translation through Genesis, through the story of Babel, through monotheistic religion. And thus, he needs the phallus to think with the other concepts that are important here, truth, law, marriage. But surely the sacred extends well beyond the heteronormative strictures or scriptures of Abrahamic exegesis. Surely the sacred has had a horizontal, historical, human life beyond and before the book. There is a word that Derrida does not much use here, or is it the translator that doesn't use it? A word that comes up all the time in religious discourse and in translation theory. So it's interesting that it's so scarce in this reading of the task of the translator. A word that Derrida or his translator prefer the words sacred or religious to. That word is faith. Faith is what translation requires for the translator to embark on such a daunting task as translation. Faith is also what God requires of humans in the absence of proof of the divine. 
Let me end by going back in good faith to where Derrida started us off by asking, why does God destroy Babel and disperse Babylonians, making them henceforth unintelligible to each other? Because they have sinned through the hubris of claiming universality, which is the privileged domain of God, by claiming to be perfect translators or by claiming not to need translation at all. If we liken translation to an act of faith, attending toward without ever reaching the sacred, then a place with no need of translation would be a faithless place indeed. If translation is mediation between the original and the version, between one language and another, or many others, then translation can indeed be counted as an act of faith that requires no proof that what it tends toward actually exists. So, we humans are cursed to translate with no proof that a single perfect version of the original is possible. Cursed to act on faith with no proof of the divine. Cursed to defer and mediate meaning without any direct access to the truth, the one or the original. So it is. Derrida writes at the end, translation promises a kingdom to the reconciliation of languages. A kingdom that is, or, or was, a Babel before it was smoked by God. So what if we didn't have Babel or the phallus as ever recurring reference? What would that kingdom promised by translation look like? Maybe this would be the decolonizing stance to imagine thinking translation without Genesis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gil? Wow, this is great. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, uh, amazing, uh, amazing questions, amazing engagement, uh, uh, very careful reading. I was feeling uh, somehow um, uh, guilty when, uh, um, when Yosef was uh, referring to page numbers. And I was like, here I am telling you Derrida is a reader and I didn't refer to any page number. I gave you one verse, which, you know, to be uh, fair, is what I try to do in my teaching uh, I, I teach, um, uh, when I teach, if, if teaching is the word, um, it, it's always um, uh, one sentence uh, for the length of a semester. So I gave you the massively accelerated version by looking at verse three of Genesis. Um, but, um, but I do hope, uh, and, and I'm grateful to Yosef uh, for the, the specific pages. Uh, um, uh, and, um, Sorry, uh, Linda, Lisa. Sorry, Lisa, Lisa uh, as well uh, for the kind of bring us back to this particular text. And um, I want to hope that by doing what I've done, uh, I stayed as close as I could to that text that you read. Um, but obviously, there is no guarantee for that, and uh, and it would take a lot of work to um, to um, to demonstrate it. Um, the, relation, the question of power, since Yosef said that uh, 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 that, that was the, the most important uh, question, um, I'm going to um, I'm going to put it in connection to Lisa's question uh, about the uh, about the phallus. Um, because I take your point, uh, obviously, why, why Babel, why Genesis, why the Bible, why monotheism, um, and obviously, why the phallus? Um, it will also resonate with the question, why keep the word translation? Um, and what I was struck by, Lisa, in the way you ended, was that you said, we humans. Now, um, in a moment like this, when we humans are being remade, um, now I'm gonna say by a virus, but what I mean by that is obviously by much more than a virus, right? Part of the problem with modern medicine is that it has convinced us that there is a cause to our illnesses. Now, uh, in the reading I've been doing in the past few weeks about pandemics, um, I realized that the history of pandemics is always the history of the poor dying much more numerously than the rich. And that was the case in fifth century uh, Rome. And that remains the case 
uh, to this day. Yet it's funny how it's always a big discovery. Oh my God, the poor and the disenfranchised are dying more numerously. Um, the notion that illness is a medical issue, it's a virus that needs to be combated. And when we have a vaccine, we will have a solution is the most explicit notion of phallus, the most explicit illustration of phallocentrism that I can think of. One thing needs to be combated. One enemy needs to be combated. What mediation is there between the virus and us is not in question. And when we say us, who do we mean? One of Derrida's most constant questions was us, who us? The funny thing is that I became a little allergic to this uh, uh, in the recent years because I've noticed, um, particularly within the academic context, that when someone says we, as I'm doing now and as you did, Lisa, someone will in inevitably come and say, who do you mean we? Which of course is absolutely justified. Because like the imperialists that Yosef reminded us of, this gesture of all inclusion is in fact the most imperialist gesture. At the same time, when someone says, I, nobody objects. Which I, perhaps because I've read a little too much Freud, I'm flabbergasted with. Because my question is, who do you mean I, right? One, in my mind, one of the most important contributions that Judith Butler made to theoretical discourse is by calling attention to et cetera. I, presumably cis male, professor of such and such origin, in such and such, such, such age, in such and such institution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I did not say that I'm a son. I didn't say that I'm a brother, not yet. But if I included that, what else? Am I husband? Am I not? Am I this? Am I that? Am I vegetarian, carnivore, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when I say I, which I, which part? All of it? Surely not. I am not a professor at every moment of my day and not every person I speak to I speak to as a professor. So when I say I, I say I now. So I should really say we in order to point to the fact that I am more than one, more than one, plus d'un, more than one, never one, never more one, always we. But we, do I mean my we, are we? We, me, who is always multiple? Yes, like all of us but not in the same way? And then is that my unity, that I am not we in the same way that you are we? So the problem, of course, is that when you say we human, as you know, we are now all dangerous because of a virus, among other reasons. And as a we, we are in fact more than human and also less than human because not all of us are human equally. So when you include we human, what you're doing, um, and please forgive me for this, I certainly don't mean for this to be um, 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 you know, injurious in any way, but you're doing exactly what Derrida describes as phallocentrism. You're producing a one, a one in relation to which we are in a determined and unavoidable relation. And you differentiate between we humans before the book. Which book? Of course, the book. Incidentally, as I found out, uh, um, not exactly a big surprise, the single most translated book in the history of languages. More than 2,500 translations. The next one, according to Wikipedia, you'd be happy to know, is The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Something like 500 languages. And close following, Pinocchio which would give you a sense of power and hierarchy. Um, so um, the, um, the problem of power 
is that it is not external. If it were, it would just be like the phallus. It would be this external reference, whether we call it the phallus or not, that is determining of anything else you want. In other words, nothing would be what it is except by reference to this outside oneness. And that is what Derrida is trying to undo. Now, undoing it doesn't mean just saying so, because no performative can actually manage that. The, the problem is how do we engage with the onenesses that keep inserting themselves in our understanding, including the oneness of the we, we humans. Um, or the oneness of faith, which I, I, I have to say, you, you took me by surprise with, uh, uh, with uh, this. God requires faith is um, something that I would not want to extend to all religions, um, to all gods. Um, and, um, and I would have to ask, but I know Tal al-Assad will help us think that through uh, more. I mean, he has already, but he will also next week. So maybe we can suspend that particular uh, conversation. Um, what's interesting is that in, in, in your responses, both of you, um, there is a kind of generalization, almost universalization, that is at work, as well as the dissatisfaction with, um, with that generalization. Because if we are all we, then who exactly does that exclude? Or who is occluded from their, occlu from their exclusion? What is hidden by this inclusive gesture, by this generalized gesture? Another way to ask this, is there something that is outside of translation? And the answer would have to be, there must be, and there cannot be. It is necessary and impossible. And therefore, we must go through translation. Yes, now not every translation, not necessarily Genesis, not necessarily the phallus, not necessarily English, and yet, Given that those ones are a site of enormous amplification, sedimentation, uh, networkization, etc., uh, not to mention contamination, there might be an access necessary and impossible through those particular ones. And obviously, the critique of phallocentrism, um, which often takes the uh, form of an affirmation of phallocentrism, yes? Is Derrida being anti-phallocentric or pro-phallocentric by mentioning the phallus? By reinscribing sexual difference, are you reinscribing sexual difference or are you attempting to translate sexual difference? You know, in Europe, um, race doesn't exist. Right? Race doesn't exist. So anyone who complains about racism is a racist, a racialist, because they keep wanting to bring race into the discourse. You're familiar with that kind of accusation. Just like in America, when you mention class, you are advocating a class conflict. In other words, to bring up that which needs to be undone ends up reinscribing that which needs to be undone. And is it a fair accusation? Absolutely not. Is it a possible accusation? Absolutely yes. Necessary and impossible. I hope I don't sound like I'm justifying those who say don't talk about race in Europe and those who say don't talk about class in America, the ultimate classless society, as you know, uh, uh, since everybody here is middle class. But, uh, um, but the problem of bringing up a signifier uh, while wanting to take it away, in fact, requires its mobilization and deployment. It's uh, uh, being put in circulation. It's being offered in translations, which I hope answers to some extent the question of why does Derrida insist on the word translation? Derrida had a word for that, paleonymy which is what he called the necessity of the use of old words. 
we know we don't want those old words. We don't want phallus. We don't want race. Except that when we say we don't want race, we don't mean we don't want to recognize racism. So how do we recognize racism while trying to abolish race? We have to do both. We have to translate and not translate. We have to use the term in order to undo the term. Now, I'm not saying this is the only strategy ever with regard to power or, uh, um, or, or any one, but there's a lot of ones that keep insisting. The phallus, we humans, at a time when we humans should probably um, uh, have some humility over our humanness and our humanity given the work that humanity has done in order to exterminate those that were called less than human. And I say it in the past tense, as if it was in the past tense. And I see that Bob Meister just joined us. So uh, the question of the past um, and of history is of course uh, essential to take into account. Um, which by the way, Yosef, when you ask about history and the historical responsibility, part of the problem is what role does history play in all of this. And one of them is, again, as Bob Meister had actually uh, explained very well in After Evil, um, saying that something is in the past is a way to ascertain that it is distant and to deny that it is still with us and how it is still with us and what it requires of us. So um, a gesture of inclusion might be the uh, gesture of exclusion. When I try to explain to my American students what another word for apartheid is, I tell them cultural difference. Yes, the respect of difference, you know, separate and equal and all that bullshit. But the problem is that the justification, one justification for apartheid was to say we are different. Now who's going to want to say we're not? In a way we're not. And in a way we are. In a way we were in a way we perhaps shouldn't be. But we cannot simply eradicate difference by fiat. Fiat, as you know, is the word that the translation of let there be light is. Fiat lux, let there be light. So we cannot simply assert transformation. We cannot simply extricate ourselves from that which we no longer want. Because if we could, Revolution would be that, but it is harder. It requires translation. And translation might be a model for revolution. Derrida talks of revolutions that have as yet no models, and we need to invent those. But um, just maybe because I, I know I'm already speaking too long, but the, the, the question of power, once again, um, uh, is not something that simply can be exteriorized. And as you yourself brought in the examples of colonial and imperial, the question is, is there any other form of power than direct and indirect? Is there another kind of power? Should we let go of power? Are we looking for no power? Levinas, one of the interlocutors of Derrida, was looking for a way out of violence. And Derrida's response was, but to get rid of violence, wouldn't that be a little violent? In other words, doesn't the gesture that constitutes violence as the ultimate out necessitate bringing it back in as a, a, again, as a gesture of exclusion? In other words, can we ever pronounce ourselves free of violence? What notion of the human or of anything could there be free of violence? Um, so translation as a universal and also not as a universal. In other words, um, as something that describes all the mediations, in fact, there is only translation, there is no original, no translation, there's only translation as a mediation, which I think is part of what Benjamin is telling us and what Derrida is telling us as well. Um, only mediation, that doesn't really help except to say no more one. No more one here, right? The author, the reader, the text, but rather no more text, no more within the text, and therefore no more without the text. Only text, sure, but text 
um, is not one. So no more one. Thank you, Gil. I'm looking at my uh, chat section here and I don't see uh, any intention expressed by anybody wanting to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, maybe you've been too absorbed in the discussion. So what I propose to do is uh, uh, to, to, to give you some time. Um, and while we, we, we take time um, to allow those who may have questions to raise these, uh, I will raise a couple of questions. Um, and uh, I will uh, also invite uh, uh, both uh, Yosef and Lisa, uh, if they want to say anything by way of continuing the conversation to feel free to do so, but not feel compelled to do so. Um, so I am a newcomer to Derrida, okay, in spite of having known Gil for many, many years. Um, and um, the first question that I had when, when reading the text, uh, and, and this is a question you really did not address in, you, in your remarks, or I didn't think you addressed, was, was why that particular starting point? Mm. Uh, why the Bible? Um, if, we're, if we're dealing with a, 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 a world of uh, uh, many languages, uh, uh, many beliefs, many faiths, maybe many ways of life, uh, not only many monotheisms, but also many non-monotheisms, uh, not only many religions uh, of the book, uh, but uh, many religions of life, uh, however you may want to put it. Uh, why this particular starting point? And, mm -hmm. and, and what does the starting point tell us uh, about the intentionality of the author. Um, so that, that was my sort of the first question that, that the text mm -hmm. raised for me. Um, then there's of course the question that the two discussants uh, raised, uh, uh, which, which is about the world of power. Um, and um, uh, Yosef raised the question of colonialism and Lisa raised the question of patriarchy. Uh, may say the original colonialism. Um, but both of them raised this question and, uh, and your response to it uh, uh, was, I thought, very Derridian. We, we, <laughs> we, we must... We must do without, without it, and yet we can't do without it. Uh, we're, we're stuck. Uh, you, you say, is there another kind of power outside of uh, direct uh, and, and indirect? Is there a third possibility? Um, you, 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 you start talking of Levinas, uh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe banish politics, uh, uh, do away with politics, uh, maybe uh, Marx is withering away of the state. Um, and, and, and we just live as uh, uh, moral beings, uh, moral, moral beings, um, I don't know. But uh, uh, so, so again, I, I thought that you, uh, if, if I may be slightly unkind, you ran away from the question. <laughs> uh, and and uh, so, so I, I wanted you to, uh, I'm interested in it, I'm very interested in it. Uh, I mean, Samir Amin, in one of his uh, writings, uh, uh, suggested that uh, w w we must not think of oneness as sameness. Uh, Samir Amin belongs to the, the world of Marxists who uh, will, will, will not give up uh, the, the, the ideal of, of, of universalism. Uh, and 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 want to stretch it as much as possible to 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 allow for a world of oneness which can also be a world of difference in ways which doesn't uh, silence difference in but these are my uh, 
not questions really, but kind of uh, uh, reflections on, on, on what you had to, what has been said until now. Um, um, yeah. can, can I say something or, or should no, I? No, no, uh, please, please, go ahead, go yeah. ahead. Um, I, I'll try to be brief. I mean, the problem of the starting point is of course that any starting point can be uh, interrogated, which of course doesn't mean that any starting point is equal. Um, but I think I want to, um, um, and please understand that I, I'm, um, I mean, whatever it means to say that, uh, I, I am as concerned with, uh, with the Eurocentric, I think I can say that, but I, I, I'm not sure. But let's say I am very concerned with Eurocentrism, with Westocentrism, um, and yet I, I am also confronted with the fact that the Bible is simply the single most translated text ever. And that its dissemination is not something that I can will myself out of. Um, in fact, um, and I'm very glad that you bring it up in that way, but because when you say many religions, right? Or for that matter, uh, the question of the inten intentionality of the author, which is also a question that Yosef uh, raised. Um, these notions, author, religion, um, are in fact very much an effect of a certain dissemination of the Bible. Um, issues of copyright are absolutely uh, linked to the emergence of print and to the transformation of the Bible that took place with print, which of course means with the Reformation. An author is first of all a legal subject and God's uh, property, my favorite version of the Bible, which I saw in one of my classes was um, uh, on the cover, it said, my book, my God. And this inscription of God as an author, the way, you know, Flaubert uh, uh, um, is, um, I thought extraordinary. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll mention uh, my, um, my sense of the dissemination of the Bible by another example. Every religious group today has asserted that life, almost every religious group, I should say, has asserted that life is more important than all of the rituals, all the congregations that, um, that otherwise must take place according to religious law and custom because of the virus. Now, as you know, this is not the first time there's a pandemic on the planet. And yet, as far as I can tell, it's the first time that every so-called religious tradition agrees on the definition of life and of the fact that life takes precedence, life defined as a physiological matter, takes precedence over any other preservation of one's soul. I find this extraordinary. It means that religion has now conceded the ground to medicine. When, in fact, the distinction between religion and medicine was never granted historically. Who's to say, first of all, that there is a difference? Right? In the Christian religion, heal, right? Heal is one of the uh, um, holy, in fact, in German, comes from heilig. Heilig means healthy. Yes? There is a place with this immunity. Uh, the holy is that which is untouched, untouched at the moment when we cannot touch each other. Yes. Um, I do not know what religion is, or the one thing that I did want to say, because it is one of the things that I end up saying in that paper I wrote called the religion of translation, is that there's something extraordinary about some of our debates over the nature of uh, terms like politics and economy. You said a world without politics very uh, interesting, politics and economy, society and religion. What, uh, what has struck me as I was working on this paper is that when we say politics, we speak Greek, the terms from 
comes from polis, yes, politike. It comes from Greek. Now, I'm not saying it's determined by that, but the fact is that the Greeks are the first one who have identified a sphere that deserves a na the name politics. They are also those who have given us the word for economy. Yes, oikonomia. Now, so when we speak about politics and we speak about economy, we speak Greek. We translate from Greek. Well, or not well, but we translate from Greek. When we say society, and when we say religion, we speak Latin. Socius, religio. We speak Latin. Some of the biggest debates I'm aware of within political philosophy, I'm thinking here of Arendt and Schmidt, for example, have argued for the, um, uh, against the collapse or even the conjunction of the social, social to the political. In other words, for Greece against Rome, which is an interesting history of the terms. When we say religion is not politics, as Americans are well known to say, and as the French, as you know, uphold uh, on a daily basis, um, I've been joking with friends that we are all now wearing the hijab and it's a law. Yes, <laughs> we're all wearing the hijab. Um, uh, it used to be forbidden. And now if you don't, you are uh, threatened by your neighbors. It's, a, it's an interesting moment in the history of ritual. Um, but when we, uh, when we distinguish politics from religion, when we say religion is not political, when we say Islam, and then we say political Islam, we point to presumably a perversion. But in fact, what we are deploying is an understanding of translation that is that the Latin does not translate into the Greek. And if you ask me then, but what of the Arabic? I will say, well, that would be my question. Um, and, and, and the question, to go back to your, uh, to your, to your question uh, about the point of departure, is that if we don't take the Bible as a point of departure, which of course we can dispense with, then our point of departure will be, for example, no the politics, no English. And yet we think in Greek and Latin, and we continue to think in Greek and Latin. I, and I would be careful not to say we think in Hebrew. Um, uh, as you have noticed, I have not referred at all to the Hebrew original. And not because it's the original, but because I think it gets us into a very, very different conversation. Um, so, Gil, we, we have yeah. uh, two questions uh, oh, on the chat box. So I'm, I'm going to uh, recognize uh, each, uh, each of these two persons. Uh, the first comes from Kasure uh, Mwesigwa. Kasure, uh, please uh, tell us which institution you're from and feel free to, to elaborate on your question. Kasure, by the way, is a Bible translator. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Jill. I'm a Bible translator and I do work with Biblically Incorporated um, as a person in charge of programs and program, uh, programs manager for the region, for the whole of the Africa continent. And my specialty is um, Greek. The question is, and no, it's not even a question, it's a statement. My statement is, um, you've made very, very good comparison of the performative and the constant. And in fact, I have realized that even when we are doing the Bible translation, especially what I refer to as the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, we re I realized that People do not think deeply about what God purportedly says and what he says. So everything is just mingled in there. We all say, God said, it is not an issue of discussion. The other important point that I also realized is that every time even reading from without is actually reading. If we say that it's not part of the text, then we are actually going wrong because whatever is there is what was either available or is what was known, but there is so much that is unknown. So our business is to try and find out what is there, what is the unknown, so that things move from the head for me to the heart. 
that's what it means for me. Thank you very much, Professor Jill, and thank you very much, Professor Mamdan. I'm glad to be part of MISA and be speaker. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm struck that you actually are advocating for the translation from the head to the heart. Um, uh, and uh, it sounds good to me. I commend you on the very, very difficult work of translation and also to, in fact, be confronted with the fact that translation continues to be necessary. Uh, in other words, that even, um, even that which has been translated needs to be translated again. Um, this Derrida would probably uh, um, refer to as the translation of translation. Um, um, he has other terms for it as well, but um, um, yeah, but I like that translation from the head to the heart. One question is what has ever happened to our heads, to our hearts and to our livers to invoke a different medical tradition uh, that we, we need for them to be translated into each other rather than uh, for them to work in some kind of uh, uh, togetherness, but that would go back to the we that Lisa uh, uh, alerted us to. Uh, we have a second question, although it was addressed privately to me, but I'm just wondering if uh, uh, David uh, Ngendo Shinda, David, would you like to uh, either formulate your comment or turn it into a question uh, and ask it for everybody to benefit from it? Well, uh, uh, I have a question. Well, a question was um, about um, uh, the, the compounded uh, confusion, which which uh, which Gil is talking about. So, mm. I I have my my father, my paternal uncle, who has translated the Bible into my mother tongue. And so, whenever I read the Bible in my mother tongue, I'm struck by the meaning making, which which always comes uh, uh, reading the, the the holy words in the in my mother tongue. So my question is uh, uh, to Gil, is, um, is, is that confusion, uh, which is compounded by the task of translation, uh, the same for, for both the, what they call the formal equivalence or word-for-word -word translation, as opposed to the dynamic equivalence, which they call the thought-for-thought -thought translation. So I want to ask Gil, uh, how, what does the reader make of uh, those two different um, modes of translating the text uh, and whether they're different how is the confusion uh, um, uh, translated in those two modes is it the same or we have some different doses of confusion that's my question i actually couldn't make up the, the the second word you said formal and dynamic but uh can you repeat the word you said after equivalence equivalence yes formal equivalence and mm. uh, and dynamic equivalence Um, thank you. I mean, it, it's interesting that you refer to, uh, uh, to your mother tongue. Uh, um, because I think that one of the things that Derrida would say, first of all, is that uh, none of us have only one language, even those of us who are monolingual. Derrida actually thematized that in another book where he says, I have only one language and it is not mine. Uh, which actually, uh, looking at the chat, uh, may also begin uh, uh, to help us think about uh, about the first uh, uh, sentence of the Gospel of John about the Word of God and God who were one. Um, two things I want to say, because I don't want to uh, uh, to forget um, uh, Mahmoud when you when you mentioned Sami Amin, I do find it extraordinary that Derrida, who is after all known as one of the philosophers of difference, right? Together with Deleuze and a, a few other people, ends up being uh, told, um, you were just telling us that it's all sameness. And we're, we're, we're interested in the world of difference and not in a world of sameness. And Derrida, of course, would say, no, no, all there is is difference. The only question is which matters, right? Which matters at which point? The point is not that the distinction between God and the word collapse. In fact, it is the first sentence of the gospel that opened them up, right? By saying the word was with God, does with mean one and the same? Or does with mean, in fact, together with, and that togetherness still means that they are distinct. And part of the problem, it's the entire history of Christianity, has been debate over 
three that is one, one that is three, and a few other versions of that, right? Substance, etc. Homoiosis, homoiosis, and uh, 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 homoiosis, uh, um, uh, the, the difference of uh, iota, yes? These are enormous theological debates. What is the same? What is not the same? What is different? Can you think difference with that sameness? And uh, uh, which difference? Um, and Derrida, of course, is the philosopher of difference, which is a word that in English keeps being pronounced uh, differently when Derrida's point was, of course, that it cannot be heard, which was part of the point. He wrote difference with an A in order to say, here's a difference in writing, where writing is primary and orality doesn't matter. That is not where it registers. And then in English, this was all upended. And then you ask why translation is impossible. Um, so in answer to the question about FOMO and dynamic, I think that part of the difficulty has to do with what Derrida calls the economy of translation. One having to do with the fact that translations constantly need to be redone. Also the fact that translations is always um, at fault, right? Traditore, traditore, we, we cannot get out of that. But again, they are necessary and they do render, render, right? That's the debt. They do give back something as they must. And although one could proliferate, the principle of economy, which in many ways is external to, uh, uh, to what should be, right? Um, commands that we don't use too many words to translate a few words. A dynamic translation would try to do as much justice to the multiplicity of meaning and also non-meaning, right? Remember that the performative has nothing to do with what it means, right? The performative is not what, what the words mean, but what the words do. How do you render a doing in translation? I think that was one of the questions that was asked about action. But of course, words are also actions. Not only, not simply, and not entirely equivalent to um, other forms of action. It's a question of translation. Um, but words are not simply about meaning, never. Um, so uh, a, a dynamic translation, a dynamic equivalence would be one that recognizes difference. That would say, when I translate the word logos, I can translate word, but of course, logos also translates reason. If the translation had been reason, yes, um, you can imagine how the enlightenment would have had to battle away that one, right? Because the Bible would have claimed reason for itself, which is of course what the enlightenment tried to uh, uh, um, wrestle away from uh, all of us by making reason its uh, property. Talk about a phallus. Um, so, um, there is, of course, a difference between, uh, uh, um, between uh, a formal equivalence and a dynamic equivalence. Um, and in, in terms of translation, I would think that the translation that proliferates, that actually keeps less to the principle of economy, would come closer to that. And the other would be the translation which, uh, um, which um, uh, Casule uh, told us about, namely the one that needs to be done again and again and again, right? the recognition that no translation is the end of the line. Um, Gil, we have uh, five questions. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, it appears there is a queue forming. So we're, we're going to return to our conventional uh, uh, format, which would be to ask, uh, to allow three people to ask questions and then you respond and mm -hmm. then have another round of uh, two or three people. Uh, so uh, I would like to recognize first uh, uh, Samson Bezabe, who is a research fellow at, uh, at, at Miser. Uh, then after that, uh, uh, Yosef uh, wants to ask a supplementary question. And then uh, Patricia uh, Daly, I think Patricia is from South Africa, but I'm not sure. Patricia, you can tell us where you're from. So, um, Dr. Bezabe, please. Thank you. Um, thank you for this very interesting um, discussion. Uh, I'm not I'm not quite familiar with Derrida, and so this was a good introduction for me in terms of uh, having a glimpse of what he's saying. Um, my, my question is, um, how can we understand the first, so you have in a sort privileged 
Genesis, the Genesis sentence, yeah? So how can we understand it through the John the Gospels chapter one uh, sentence, which says the, you know, first there was word, the word was with God and God is with us now. Um, so for me, there is no, if, if we understand this through the John the Gospels sentence, you know, there's, there's no distinction between the first and, and the second, you know, every time, everything has come together. So the world has become, which is God, has become, has become human and so on and so on. So uh, I was thinking of this, and if you put this into conversation, I would be really, um, I will be really happy to understand it. And, and of course, I'm looking at this in terms of the history of Christianity as well, because Derrida, I think he was, he was embedded in the Catholic tradition, where there is the, where the Holy Spirit uh, emanates from two sources. But then I'm coming from the Orthodox background with media physicists, where, uh, you know, God has become the flesh and there's a whole set of debates and separation that occurred because of that. So if Derrida was writing from an Orthodox media physicist position, would he be have we would, we, would, he, would he be writing in this manner? So why privilege the Genesis? And then of course, I feel the Catholic interpretation within it. Uh, it might not be clear, but uh, this is my question. No, no, it's a great Thank question. You. Thank you. We're going to go to Yosef for your supplementary mm -hmm. question. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, I know Derrida, Derrida uh, really never dealt with this question, but uh, as a Derridian, I would like to take this opportunity and uh, ask you. Um, just a poor translation, just a poor translation. Yes. yes. <laughs> how would a deconstruction as a, as a political project, how would a deconstructivist politics look like empirically? I know Derrida talks about the democracy to come, democracy as a promise and so on. But empirically, uh, how would a deconstructivist state look like, uh, to put it in a problematic way? Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Patricia, please uh, identify your institution for us and, uh, and go ahead and make your Patricia, comments. can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, hi, I'm actually <laughs> in uh, California and oh, I'm uh, okay. not, an, not unsimilar to the climate in South Africa, but no, different part. I'm, a, I'm, in, um, I'm, I'm from Columbia. I'm in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia. Um, hi, Gail. So I have a question hi. about legib legibility because it seems to me as though part of the questions that have been raised about um, translation and what does not appear in translation or what the question of the one could be slightly modulated by thinking about questions of legibility. For example, whenever we engage in translations, um, we often begin to include prefaces, historical information. In other words, this whole other realm of legibility becomes part of our textual apparatus. It becomes, you could say, culture, um, history, and even death becomes included in terms of biography, and, and, and whatnot. And I wonder if the question of legibility of what gets excluded or what counts, and obviously how hierarchies of differences become set up, could be, could be slightly modulated by thinking about the question of legibility before the question of difference, if that makes sense. In other words, what becomes constituted in a universe um, of legibility. And might this then change the way in which religion would be understood? Do you, does that make sense, Gil? I mean, I think so, though I, I suspect that your answer to the question will be much more interesting than mine. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but we, we, can, uh, we, we can, we can get, I, I can try. I mean, thank you for the question about, uh, uh, about the Gospel of John. Obviously, it would take us into a, a different play of languages. Again, uh, the question of how to translate logos. Uh, um, is part of it, but I really, really like um, that you articulate it in terms of once John has spoken, then the difference 
that was uh, otherwise there at the beginning um, has been abolished. Um, because of course, that is the history of the relation between Christianity and what we call Judaism, not entirely accurate, but certainly the relation of, of Christianity to its sources, biblical and otherwise, yes? Um, the very designation, Old Testament, New Testament, speaks to that. Are they different or are they the same? Are they one Bible or two Bibles? Um, and of course, the decision, the decision whereby one says, but John explains to you what the distinction or the lack of distinction there is between God and the world, and there is none, implies <laughs> that whatever the Old Testament, which as long as it remains the Old Testament, uh, is of course only defined in relation to the new, um, which by the way corresponds exactly to what Derrida describes, whereby that which comes later, and that later is not necessarily a historical later, right? That which is secondary, ends up defining that which is primary, which is why I ended up writing a book where I ask, um, um, where I say um, why I'm such a good Christian, which also goes back to the, to, to the issue of why start with the Bible. And the question is, is it escapable, right? It would be like asking the question, which I tried to ask in, in, in this book I wrote called Blood, is there anything outside of Christianity? Which of course also means that we must understand Christianity as something dramatically different than what we call religion, right? Because religion is only a part of life, but Christianity remade the world. And the question is, how much has it remade the world, right? What remains that is not Christian? And I do think that the questions you've been asking me, all of you, um, uh, about the necessity or lack thereof of the Bible, which means of God, of the monotheistic God, of the Christian God, or for that matter, if you want, of the Jewish God, although, again, I would want to keep the distinction, although I am not certain that it's possible. In other words, I am not certain that it's possible to think about God in any language at this point and of any religion, except if we found a tradition that actually said, don't call me religion. Don't translate that which I am, that which we are, as religion. Yes? Because one would have to disagree, first of all, with that notion. Now, in many ways, a lot of Christians and a lot of Muslims and a lot of Jews have been making that argument. I am not just a Christian on Sunday. I am a Christian all the time. What do you mean distinguishing religion from politics? Why? Is God's rule something that I can dispense with when I choose a president? Since when? Who decided that? When was religion just religion? When was the tradition to which I belong just something that I can set aside when I do more important things like politics or economy? These are, of course, institutional translations that we in our bodies have experienced, but we cannot simply dispense with them. And one of those that is very hard to dispense with is which I very rarely use the expression, the Hebrew Bible, because to say the Hebrew Bible suggests that I have extricated myself from the notion that continues to rule, namely that the Bible is the Old and the New Testament. And to extricate oneself from that, is very difficult. And if I may put it in a very short manner, the state of Israel can either be defined as a Jewish state or as a Christian state. And to my mind, it is a Christian state. Of course, there's a lot of Jews that will disagree with me and a lot of them in Israel and not only in Israel, yes? But the difficulty of speaking about the Bible outside of the understanding that has been produced by Christianity, which includes the Gospel of John, is part of the difficulty. In other words, is the distinction abolished between word and God, just that the distinction between Jewish and Christian is abolished by the Judeo-Christian or by the New Testament? That is, after all, the question that we continue to deal with. And, uh, um, and the way in which we, 
deal with it is of course by singularizing Islam, which is not an interest, uninteresting moment. When you look at the uh, planetary dimension of Islamophobia today, you have to ask, what is it that is going on there? Uh, and for the record, the first response of Christians when Islam arrived was, the Jews are back. And that, I think, is absolutely determining of anything that we are thinking of. So what would Derrida say if he was orthodox? I like that you put Derrida as a Catholic, because in many ways it's true. And yet Derrida um, was uh, Jewish and affirmed his Jewishness. Now, how so? What did he mean? And does that mean that he was not Catholic for all that? That would be for a longer conversation, but I, I really, um, uh, I'm very invested in the distinction between the Western Christian and the Eastern Christian, uh, Eastern also being Southern. Um, and, and I think that there's a, a, a path of, uh, of reflection that is very important. Deconstructivist politics. Uh, uh, first, deconstructivist would be a term that I would refrain from. Um, a translation into politics, maybe if we agree that politics is a different language, but then in order to agree that it's a different language, we'd have to also recognize that our language, our thought is not already completely occupied by a certain understanding of politics. Um, is meaning political? Is meaning political? Is speaking political? Uh, is engaging with the question of translation political or not political? Is it, um, is it uh, passive? Um, do we pay attention to um, the tweets of uh, uh, um, a demented president or do we not? Is language political action or not? Um, I almost want, I, I, Mahmoud will say that I'm escaping the question. I almost want to say there is no politics that is not deconstruction. Politics is deconstruction and vice versa. Conflict, translation, displacement, misunderstanding. What is not political, right? Just like we could ask what is not translation. And yet I have said, politics is a Greek term. Why can we only think in Greek? What would it mean for us to think of human and non-human collectives in a way that does not deploy uh, a, a Greek or Christian concept like community, community, right? The substance coming together, which is a fundamental Christian contribution to anthropology. Uh, and you might read Roberto Esposito on this. So there, there are, uh, um, there are questions. Um, I'm not evading them, I don't think, but rather uh, uh, struggling with the possibility of extricating oneself in order to say, can we go there? But maybe we are always already there, right? Another Derridian expression that Derrida uh, borrows and translates from Heidegger. Um, there are only many translations, constantly translations, constantly political actions, as it were. Um, and the question is, is there a right one? Is that the right question? Um, there's also always difference. And as you know, one of the great things about capitalism, or for that matter, about democracy, and the fact that we continue to, call, to talk about democracy, to my mind, is one of the most amazing feasts of translations. Yes, we continue referring to the West as democracies, even though we know they are plutocracies. We know that, and yet we keep referring to them as democracies. Now, there might be a performative dimension to that. Maybe we'll bring about a democracy to come. But I'm not convinced that I live in a democracy and I don't know who, who is uh, at this particular moment. And yet we are in a democracy. Um, is this a bad translation? Most likely. Is this politics? It is. To give up on the word, much as USF was uh, uh, suggesting with translation, to give up on the word democracy would be to say, that's it. It's not a democracy. There's nothing to fight for. Right? It would be dangerous. And yet it would be an accurate description. So what do we pick, the constitutive or the performative? Must we choose? Maybe we should struggle on both, right? And that would be very political. We're not a democracy. We must be a democracy. We call ourselves a democracy in order to 
become one. Sorry, I forgot that I have other questions. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, so, yes, Trisha, thank you. I, uh, um, it's funny because I, I think I was taken aback a little bit about the fact that you talk about the translation apparatus for those of us who are practitioners of translation. And I think that part of the way the conversation has gone, certainly uh, uh, for me, is that we are all involved in multiple gestures of translation. And that translation happens, yes, when we translate a particular text, but it also, tra it also happens when we are in conversation. I'm, I'm right now translating your question. Uh, and again, with more or less uh, uh, faithfulness. Um, so the, the preface's notes biography, in other words, the apparatus that needs to be produced in order to produce legibility, I think, and you'll correct me if I'm misunderstanding, but I think that what you're saying has to do with the fact that there are traces, there are words, acts, speeches, speech act, that are not recognizable as such, right? Uh, um, Judy Butler after, uh, um, after Kristeva and others would speak of the, of, of the abject, that which is not even recognizable as speech, right? A voice that is not even recognizable as a voice and therefore cannot even be heard because hearing it would require acknowledging it for what it is, right? Can the subaltern speak if you, if you wish? Um, so the issue of legibility um, implies that, which would be another way of talking about the Bible, implies that in fact, oh, talking about Marx and Freud, which are I think a few of those where even those of us who have not read them would have to recognize that we have. Who doesn't know that Freud is obsessed with sex? Who doesn't know that Marx is about class struggle, right? And the critique of capitalism. Even those who have not read anything know that. In other words, we have all read already, poorly or successfully, yes, or, or well. But we've all read Marx, we've all read Freud, we've all read the Bible. The only question is how well? And Derrida, of course, would say, well, there might be a little more work to do, right? Um, I'm not sure, so legibility would have to do with, in fact, uh, uh, with, with that which we can always, always take for granted. The fact that when we look at a text in the broadest possible sense, we must recognize it as text. And that if we don't, which sometimes we don't, then, uh, um, then the question becomes, how do we open our ears so that we can respond to that which we do not recognize as a call, as something that demands our response, right? by way of denial or by way of simply unrecognizability? How does something become legible? I think that's what you're asking. What I'm not sure on, and, and so you can correct me, what I'm not sure on is how you make the link to uh, religion. My issue with religion has to do with, in fact, the translation of religion, whereby we recognize religious traditions as if this was a universal. As you know, not so long ago, everybody recognized races as the way to divide humanity. I'm not sure we're completely over that. But one of the struggles I find myself in is much as we are ambivalent about the discourse of race and of course racism and racialism, we should be equally ambivalent with the discourse of religion, particularly when it takes the form of, um, uh, of opposition to religion. Yes, oh, religion, that's bad. Yes, just like race is bad, but race and religion were invented at the same time. Between the 16th and the 19th century, those two categories as ways of understanding the world came up together. And often you had to choose, are Jews a race or are they a religion? Are they a nation or are they a religion? And those choices should be problems for us, problems of translation. Not one where we can say, oh, I know what Judaism is, it's a religion. Or I know what Judaism is, it's an ethnicity. No. Um, or I know what religion is, it's not politics. Or I know what politics is, it's not culture. Sorry, Mahmoud, I had to say that one. Um, it is not granted, right? Um, the distinction between those, and again, we're talking about Greek and Latin. Kultur, right? Kultus, cult, comes from Latin. Cultivation, agriculture, right? How do we distinguish that from politics? 
Well, if we speak Latin, if we speak Greek, yes. But if we don't, then what exactly are we distinguishing? And what distinction are we calling for? We're translating, which is fine, but then we should reflect on what kind of translation we are going for. Um, and language, uh, to go back to Yosef, comes back to being exceedingly political. Exceedingly political. It's just that sometimes I feel like language is already fascist, right? But that the, the, the words that we have to talk about the real is already implicating us in the worst politics, right? Just like when we say, I hope they're gonna find a cure for the virus. That to me is already fascism because it assumes that the medical solution is what we're looking for rather than a social or political or economic solution. Who's to say that the virus is only a medical problem? Translation, let's listen to the, to, to the physicians. Oh, good for us. I'm sure they're gonna find a solution as I don't need to tell you, those of you who, who, who are in Africa, the, the benefits, the benevolence of modern medicine in under colonial regimes is of course a well-established fact. So we should listen to, them, to the doctors because you know, they're good people. Of course they're good. We clap for them at 7 p.m. Uh, uh, every evening and we should, but whether they should decide how our lives are conducted, whether we should make them the politicians, I don't know. Thank you, Gil. Um, I have uh, another four questions here. So now, what I'm proposing is we have, uh, uh, if Gil, you can bear with us, two last rounds uh, of questions. I will recognize three now and, uh, and then another last round and then we will. Uh, what is your schedule? You, you, you're supposed we, to end in 45 minutes? So. Uh, yeah, we, we normally, well, we, yeah. we allow three hours for this. Okay. Uh, that's the that's the duration of a of a miser seminar. Usually. Right. Thank you um, all for your patience. I uh, um, you should feel free to uh, tell me to uh, you know speak less. Uh, we invited you to speak. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> Not to speak less. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry, I, uh, I, I misunderstood I, the task. <laughs> I, I have. I will recognize uh, Lillian, uh, and then uh, Anna, and then Everest. All, all three are students at uh, Miser from the first year to the fifth year. Uh, Lillian, please go ahead. Um, thank you, Professor Gill, for the presentation. Um, mine, mine is a question. I am wondering, um, how do you categorize words that prompt actions or performances, for example, a phrase like, um, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower. Mm -hmm. how, how would you categorize that? Because at some point, it calls people into real performance. Could, could it also be a performance um, speech or something like that? Thank you. Um, Anna? Yes, Professor. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Professor and Jar, this extraordinary opportunity for us to hear from you. Um, I have a question, but maybe it's a sort of a clarification on what you've already touched before uh, in the beginning of your lecture. That is, if you were to um, follow what Derrida is saying, uh, what is the difference between interpretation and translation, if there is a difference at all? Uh, because you did say that there isn't a difference between performance and descriptions. So um, I was thinking if you could just clarify this for us once again. Thank you. Thanks once again. Everest. Thank you, Professor. Uh, my question is, uh, I, I mean, uh, from what you, you underscored in your presentation, uh, you alluded to the fact that religion recognizes the significance of life over, the, over faith in this era of the pandemic. And the, yes, indeed, we can see that within this uh, lockdown, churches have been closed down and uh, even healers are no longer playing their role of, of, of healing uh, in this uh, period of uh, the coronavirus. There is a question over the relevance of religion now more than ever before. How do you then envision the role of religion in the face of a world that is troublesome 
how do you then situate the biblical religious interpretation of the world problems? How would you respond to the atheists, people who don't believe in God? And as a matter of fact, you know that in many developed countries, uh, faith is no longer playing a, a vital role in the lives of people. Then how do you envision the role of religion after this pandemic? Are churches going to open anyway after this? How is religion going to again influence the lives of people in a world in which they cannot offer any solution? Thank you very much, um, Gil. Um, I, I feel like uh, quoting um, uh, Talal, uh, who quotes um, his taxi driver in uh, Cairo, um, after having heard a, a long uh, litany of problems, um, Talal turned to his driver and said, so what's the solution? And his driver turned around and said, solution? Who said that because there are problems, that means there are solutions? I think uh, um, it, it struck me uh, um, as, um, as a good Derridian answer. Uh, um, so um, come let us build. Absolutely, it's a performative. Um, um, it, um, it brings about a unity that was not granted, right? Whoever, and uh, I didn't talk about, uh, uh, about this with regard to, uh, to the text, but one of the other ways of understanding uh, Derrida, um, uh, which he thematizes uh, in, in other texts, uh, but is at work here, is simply to think about the frame. Is the frame external? or is the frame constitutive? Yes? Any exercise in deconstruction is an exercise in framing and reframing. Right? What are the limits? Think of the economists and their externalities. Right? What happens if you broaden the frame and include externalities inside the frame of economics? That would be a Derridian exercise, a deconstructive exercise, to say that which economy defines as its object must be reframed. What Derrida does, by the way, with the Tower of Babel is that he begins it earlier. The episode begins when it says, and the earth was one people and one language, something like that. Um, and which is uh, um, chapter uh, 11. But Derrida begins earlier, which enables him to identify the builders of the tower with the Semites. Now, I have issues with this identification of Semites. They are definitely the children of Shem. Whether that entitles us to call them Semites is another matter that has to do with the complex history. Um, we don't need to get into that. But what's absolutely important is that as a result of his reframing and starting with the children of Shem, rather than with the, the, the beginning of the narrative of the, Bible, of the tower, come let us build, or, or they arrived to the plain of Shinar, um, Derrida reframes and it enables him to ask vastly different questions of the text. And, um, and that is one of the uh, things that he does. So um, there are people, those who arrive to the Valley of Shinar, and, um, and then someone says, come. Maybe they all say together, come. But if they all say come, then who's supposed to come? They're already here. So there's an imperative, come, an invitation, come and let us build, let us become builders. Until then, like a parent who never had a child, so not a parent, um, they were not builders, they become builders. So by virtue of let us build, they become builders. It's a performative. Um, I think there may have been more to the question, uh, um, but if so, I didn't hear, and perhaps I'll answer by, by addressing what Anna said. I didn't say that the, um, that the distinction between the, the performative and the constative is abolished. In fact, this would be a, a, a good moment to talk about the way Derrida talks about writing and orality, because that's a big site of, of misunderstanding. Derrida never said that there is no difference between the, writing, between the written and the oral. Never said that. Derrida is a philosopher of difference. He merely asked, what is the difference? And how's the difference asserted? And what is, question of power, what is the superior term? 
which term is considered to be the better. If you ask people for thousands and thousands of years, what is the better communication? Starting with Plato, if you'd like. We don't have to start there, but that's one way. There is no question that orality is better. Just like we would say today, it would be better if we were face-to-face -face rather than um, on computer. No question. Is there a difference? What's the difference? What's better? So Derrida says, over the course of Western history, orality has been better. Why? Well, one argument is living speech, right? And that's what Plato opposes in writing. It's basically dead, right? The dead letter, as Paul, St. Paul would say. Um, writing is less. Writing is that which you talk about, think about the derivativeness of translation. It's secondary. We don't really need it. It's like the constative after God's performative. It's just something we don't need. It's just a supplement. But that supplement ends up being massively important. Yes? So Derrida explains that the distinction between orality and, 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 and writing has to do with presence. When I speak to you, presumably I am present to myself and present to you, and vice versa when you respond. Whereas when I write, I write to you because you're not here. You are absent. I am present on my end, but you are absent on the other end. And then you receive my letter. You are present to my letter, but not to me. And Derrida says, very simply, but if my presence to myself was sufficient for my speech to function as speech, was in fact ideal for my speech to function as speech, then you could never hear me. If the word is never distinct from God, then the word is with God and therefore God is with himself and there is no one else. In order for the word to reach me, God needs to take the word out of himself. So the word may be God, but has to stop being God for a while so that God can no longer be present to the word so that the word can be the word and that word can reach me. Which means that even God's living speech must leave God behind. And in order to reach me, must be capable of in fact reaching me even when I am no longer there. So what you may have heard of in literary criticism under the figure of the death of the author, is also the death of the reader, the death of the recipient. Yes? So, speech, living speech, is predicated on the absence of the speaker so that the speech can reach the listener. In other words, that which has been used to say that orality is more present than, speech, than writing ends up being the very way in which orality functions, which is not to say that there's no more difference between orality and writing, but rather that that which has been said to be the difference according to which writing was less is actually defining both terms. So to go back to the constative and the performative, what Derrida would say is that of course there is a difference because the constative is a very peculiar form of performative. When I say, here is a here is my hand, I make it look like I'm just describing, right? What performative is there in that? And yet there is a performance. I just called your attention to my hand. I made you think of my hand. I made you look at my hand. I brought my hand into the conversation. That was a performance. In other words, even a constative calls attention to my hand rather than to my other hand or to my glasses or to my hair or whatever, right? The performance is that which brings about the attention to a particular thing. And yet it masks itself as uh, just a constative. I'm just describing what there is. My hand was there before I called attention to it, as it were, but it wasn't. So not that there's no difference between the two, but that we must recognize one functioning in terms of the other. Um, so, there is a difference, of course, between interpretation and translation. Um, 
in many ways translation should render untouched meaning and presumably form and presumably performance right in other words there should be no interpretation in translation for a translation to be what it is in other words it should not interpret the text it should render the text and yet of course it is a translation it is a performance but a different one than the original which was legible in a different way um i would i would recall what trisha asked us about namely legibility and the distinction between reading and, and interpreting i think is an important one which uh for the most part is not given uh i think enough um attention but um, um there's only so much we can do at once um I don't, I, I suppose my question about uh, um, uh, Everest, um, I suppose my question about the role of religion would be the role of anything at this point. Why would we single out religion as uh, an important actor? Um, I do stand by what I said earlier, which is that it astonishes me that religious traditions by now recognizable because everybody agrees that Islam is a religion, Christianity is a religion, Judaism is a religion, uh, Buddhism is a religion, etc. Um, um, religious traditions have undergone a tremendous transformation at this particular moment by deciding that their ritual took second seat to the rituals of medicine. It's important to wash your hands with soap it's not important, not equally important to do your ablutions before entering the mosque, uh, um, before prayer, together, right? Collectively. Um, so that's very important to take into, uh, into account. But we all must ask ourselves, all the collectives that we are, right? Me as collective, as I was saying before, but all the collectives that we are must ask ourselves what action should we take but also what actions have we taken what role have we played in bringing about that which is right one of for me the the i want to say funniest but also most tragic moments uh at the beginning of uh, obama's president's uh, presidency was when he said the united states is going to take a more proactive position in the middle east Two months before, as the president-elect, he had authorized the shipment of ammunition and bombs and, 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 and other guns to Israel, which was in the process of bombing Gaza. Yes? So when he said, we are now going to be proactive, what exactly was he saying? That the United States had not been proactive in the Middle East, as if anything that is happening in the Middle East could happen outside of what the United States does there and is there? What do you mean more proactive? Um, if, if what you mean is sending more guns and bombs, you know, we can do without. And, and of course, people criticize Bush for his, uh, Trump, sorry, for his Middle East policy. But one of the things that appears to be happening, and I'm not saying it's a good thing, um, but it's a good thing if we are opposed to American imperialism, which doesn't mean we support Russian imperialism or Chinese imperialism. But nonetheless, it is interesting that what Trump has done is diminish the significance of American role in the Middle East. And that in itself is at least opening for change. Whether that would be a good change or a bad change, I wish I knew uh, I'm not a prophet. Um, but I don't think that's something to lament not in itself, at least as opening different possibilities. Because the, the United States have been in the Middle East and we see what they have done. And it has not been an improvement on anybody's lives and certainly not Palestinian lives. So um, we want to take that into account, right? But that moment, when do we take action? As you asked me, Everest, for me, would also have to include a question as, and what kind of actions have we been taking until now? Yes? including somehow our inaction, right? But let's not take for granted uh, that we have been inactive or that we need to start anew. Um, we are in translation. We are circulating and moving within the realm of action. 
Um, yeah. Thank you, Gil. Uh, the, the last round of, uh, of questions. We have two questions, actually. Uh, one is from Jacob Katumusime. Jacob is a third year student at Miser. And uh, then a supplementary question from Lisa uh, Daman. And so I'm not going to come back to uh, Yosef and Lisa, as I had promised earlier. Um, so after, after these two questions, uh, we'll invite Gil to sort of not simply engage with the questions, but also sum up uh, for, for today. And then I will have some final words to say. Um, please, Jacob. Oh, thank you, Professor Dani. Uh, and thank you, Professor Anija, for the thought-provoking discussion. Uh, so uh, my question is on the binaries that you you create that Derrida creates of the proper and common noun. So we see that from our reading, the the the, the untranslatability of meaning comes because trans, that which is in the translation of the proper noun is always actually a common noun. The, the proper noun is, is translated as a common noun. So we see that the multiplicity of tongues gives us the category of the common noun in the end. So we, we shall see that different spatial and, uh, and, uh, and temporal context will give us that multiplicity of common nouns. So, but most importantly still, untranslatability is because the original text mutates, it transforms itself, so we cannot find it. So um, my question is, why does the reader maintain the category of the proper noun or even that of the common noun? Because thinking about it, every common noun would have to become a proper noun in the end within its given context. And, and so why should translation remain translation, not a proper noun or not the original in fact? So that in the end we see an original not as a constant, but as a context-specific text. Thank you. Lisa. Yes. Um, actually, my supplementary is not so much to my own uh, performance. It's more a supplement to Everest's um, question about you know, what, what next for religion, what has, in, in response to what you said about religion deciding that um, medical rituals are more important than their own. Um, I just wanted to add something very empirical uh, to well, my, my confinement in Kampala allows me to hear uh, both an imam and a preacher once a day over a loudspeaker, quite a you know, serious loudspeaker, um, give, the, give their sermons. So they're not, you know, quitting. <laughs> there's not a sort, there's not a... a, a Maybe what's what's different is that me hearing these these preachings, um, my, the way that I, I receive them has changed. Now I'm quite happy to hear them because it's a sound, because the city has gone quiet. So now this means life. This means that something is continuing outside. Whereas you know months months before I would be very annoyed by hearing these sounds over all the other sounds of the city. That's just a remark. Thank you. Go ahead, Gil. Right. Um, so the distinction between proper noun and common noun, I wish, uh, um, you know, uh, um, one of the things um, that um, makes uh, um, uh, my investment in, in the construction is that there, there's something um, humbling about it, right? When 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 Derrida actually says um, uh, deconstruction happens, he's not saying I invented it. Um, and I think that it's important to distinguish between whatever we call deconstruction um, and whatever we understand uh, as you know Derrida's work. Um, now you could say that there's an imperial gesture when you say deconstruction is what happens, which is one of the things Derrida says. It's actually it might be a colonizing of you know uh, of ontology, um, but there's also a way of reading. You know, it's a little like uh, um, uh, when one says God spoke to me, is one being modest 
or, um, and what, you know, and I say, God spoke to me and I'm just telling you what he said. I'm, I'm nothing. Yes. But this, I'm nothing because what I'm saying is God, um, is, um, is a way to, uh, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, is also a way of aggrandizing myself tremendously. Yes. Um, by saying what I'm saying is God's words. Um, so the most humble may also be the most preposterous, right? The most uh, unhumble. Um, so as much as I would want to say that Derrida was both very humble and very not humble, uh, um, uh, it seems difficult for me to give him credit for having created the distinction between the proper noun and the common noun. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, but just like with uh, 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 Lisa's question about the phallus, uh, Mahmoud's question about the reinscription of the Bible, uh, um, I, I completely agree that there is a reinscription of a particular frame of uh, speech and thinking um, that Derrida uh, performs, right? There's no question that, that he could have performed otherwise. He could have done something else. Um, but insofar as he inscribes this one, I think one of the sites of translation is precisely what happens between the proper noun and the, co and the common noun. Um, one could say, and I have a friend who's written a whole paper on this, that uh, Derrida actually um, uh, is making a, a category mistake because proper nouns simply don't enter into the question of translation because they have nothing to do with meaning. But to say that translation has to do with meaning is a particular understanding of translation. And so what Derrida brings in is the distinction between the proper noun and the common noun in order to say there is a translation that happens between them and to them. Um, and, um, and this is one of the sites of confusion, right? Since Babel means the gate of God, though in the text it means Babylon, but the text makes it mean confusion, right? So there's a triple uh, take on on that proper name, which keeps being translated or deployed and redeployed, um, and ultimately it doesn't matter because it, it shouldn't matter because it is a proper name, um, which ends up meaning confusion. So it becomes a common name, and and uh, but it doesn't stop for all that being also a proper name. Um, I like the aesthetic um, uh, moment. Um, it is. It is one of the few ways in which the, the religious experience, and uh, I've been very privileged to sit in, in Talal Assad's class, where one of the books we read by Peter Deere had to do with the changes in the, in the understanding of the word experience and the word experiment. In fact, the separation between experience and experiment. And one of the things that struck me, Peter Deere doesn't quite say that, but it struck me that experience became aesthetic and religious whereas experiment became scientific. And that distinction, of course, is, uh, is very important. And it's interesting that a lot of uh, people who might understand themselves as secularists allow themselves an aesthetic experience, which is very hard to distinguish from a religious one, so-called religious one. Uh, um, but, uh, um, but, I, but I think that there's a lot of uh, potential in that uh, in order to perhaps begin to recognize ourselves as not uh, militant secularist in recognizing that there's a way of appreciating, um, um, you know, the sensibilities that religion, the religious traditions uh, carry. Uh, and by this, I don't mean that we should put, uh, you know, all, all religious artifacts in museums, uh, uh, but rather that we may recognize that museums are um, much more religious than we would like to uh, believe. Um, but I'm also with Talal on the question of faith and belief as not being necessarily the central question of, uh, of religion. And in fact, you just uh, told us that uh, that is uh, very important. Great, great questions. Uh, um, um, so you want me to say what now? Uh, summing up, <laughs> summing up, summing up. You can elaborate on great questions, or you can say thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I, uh, I, I've, I've, uh, I've tried to give you different ways of, uh, of following this question of translation, right? Translations of translations. Uh, uh, the more than one, the no more one, more than one. 
and and the question of the frame, um, thinking about the dis about difference in a different way, right? Thinking about difference not so much as what is, but rather as what affects both terms, right? So that we we um, we reflect on what we think of as the one that would be independent of the different thing that it is in relation, a lesser relation to, um, in order to um, kind of recenter the difference um, right between writing and orality, for example, and rethink the hierarchy, because Derrida would say there is no difference that is not hierarchical. And maybe that's, a, 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 again, another way of thinking about power. What is the power of hierarchical difference, since so far we do not have a way of, um, of thinking difference in a non-hierarchical way. What would it mean to put all differences on a level? To say that, I don't know, um, um, no difference matters or all differences matter, right? It's, it's a difficult uh, echoes of, you know, Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter uh, uh, are intended here. How do we do that? Uh, and, and what's the ideal? To say that no difference matter? politically, right? So that none of our differences are acknowledged, recognized, entered in conversation with, or do we say all differences matter and all differences should be respected from the macro to the micro? And what would a collective look like that would make room and give power as it were to all differences, yes? Um, remember, necessary and impossible. Differences must be recognized, acknowledged, respected, but the respect, acknowledgement of all differences is not only impossible, but it would lead to, in fact, um, a, a kind of weird sameness. Yes? Um, so necessary, impossible. Protection as the uh, uh, end of us, if all we do is protect ourselves. The one thing I haven't talked about, which, uh, I mean, there are many things I haven't talked about, if you believe it, uh, um, uh, but has to do with, with, um, with the idiom of responsibility, which is very much in the, in the text, which, which has to do with ethics and the question of deconstruction and ethics. Um, I try to mention something about the, the one and the second, right? The master and the slave. That response is actually what defines anything. One, no one, which is why no one is one. Right? I'm fascinated by those moments when you start engaging in some criticism and people say, well, what do you propose? If one is supposed to propose a new, you know, form of life, clearly it's going to have to be more, you know, conversational to come up with alternatives, right? Um, the point, though, is to recognize that nothing is ever said that does not call for a response that in fact is defined by the response. The way Derrida puts it is that the decision is always the decision of the other. Only the other, right? Remember the soldiers that say bravo? Only the other decides what I am. Not because I am completely given over, but because whether we're talking about recognition or annihilation, I have to open the door and hear what is coming, right? And I cannot do without. I cannot risk myself into the world. I cannot um, take down my protections unless uh, I am in some form of sociability. The response is first, right? Not because it is one, but because it makes the one what it is, right? Just like in Let There Be Light, the concertive made the performative successful. It is what told us that the, the performative was successful. Without it, we actually wouldn't know. It wouldn't have meant anything, right? God needed his creation, is the way some theologians might put it, right? In order for his kingdom to be recognized for his kingship to be recognized. I'm using a particular idiom. We don't have to agree with that. But the point is that the decision is always the response of the other. 
that's another way to think about the relation between translation and original, yes? The translation is the response to the original. It makes the original. Thank you very much. This has been uh, uh, really exciting. I uh, both preparing for it and, and just uh, all of your questions have been uh, uh, incredibly thought provoking. And uh, I um, both admire the engagement and the uh, um, and and your ability to converse. I assuming that my uh, somehow um, not systematic remarks were not easy to uh, um, to just listen to. So thank you. Your um, remarks, whether systematic or not, uh, have been very fruitful, very provocative, and I'm sure they are going to lead all of us into multiple unanticipated directions. Um, just to, uh, to make sure that we all know, uh, Professor Anija will be back with us next week, uh, but as discussant. Uh, not as the speaker. So he will be one of the two discussants to uh, uh, Professor Talal Assad's uh, lecture. Uh, the second discussant will be uh, Yahya Seremba uh, from uh, Miser. Uh, Professor Talal Assad's lecture, as I said at the outset, uh, is on uh, thinking about religion through Wittgenstein. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, see you next Wednesday to register. Please send a note to uh, communication at miser at gmail.com. Viva.